Hi there, uh, this is Justin Sheffield from University of Southampton and this presentation is going to give you an overview of the work that myself and Solomon Gebrich Orkos have been doing on large-scale hydrological modelling. To give you an overview, we've been working here at Southampton to understand the variability in hydrological conditions and how this manifests in risks of extreme events such as floods and droughts and then how this variability can feed into the integrated modelling. And we do this through developing and running and analysing hydrological models at high resolution, which we do historically, so we go back in time to 1980, and then we look to the future as well under two different timescales. So we're interested in what's going to happen under climate change over the next uh, decades, up to a century, um, but we're also interested in what might happen to hydrological variability and the risks of droughts and floods over seasonal timescales. So that's seasonal forecasts. And that's important for um, understanding the potential to improve decision making over seasonal timescales. So we've, we've been working with the three case studies, so the Volta, uh, the Nile and um, the large basins of Myanmar as well. And this map just shows you those locations. It also shows you the dots are observational stations that we have access to that we can do some evaluations and calibration of our modeling system. So how do we do the modeling? Um, well, we use two models. We use a hydrological model called the VIC model, which stands for the Variable Infiltration Capacity Model. Um, this runs on a grid basis at five kilometers across the basins, and then we use that to predict runoff. That runoff is then routed down a streamflow network using another model um, called RAPID. And we've set those up at high resolution across the three case studies. You can see on the right, this is the Volta, and you can see the detail in the river network that was simulating streamflow down. So as I said, we do the hydrological modeling on a gridded five kilometer by five kilometer grid basis and we drive that modeling using a bias corrected meteorological forcing data set so things like precipitation and temperature and we've been looking at the outputs from the models the stream flow and so on and we've been evaluating that against observations that are available and you can see that on the right for those uh, red dots those are stations stream flow stations where we have observational data that we can compare with the model to see how well it's doing so we've done historic simulations and also some initial future climate simulations as well. Um, and we provided that streamflow data to the University of Manchester and the climate historic climate data to the University of Newcastle. Here's a quick example of some evaluations of that modeled streamflow. So we've done this over the whole of uh, Africa where there are easily available stations, observational stations of streamflow. And the map there shows how well the model is doing in terms of the correlation coefficient. So where we have very deep red colors, that means we're up into about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 in our correlation coefficient. So the model is doing very well. Where we're down to some of the more orangey colors, especially in some of the drier regions down in um, the southwest, down into Namibia and South, South Africa, not doing so well. Some examples for Myanmar are shown on the bottom here. Um, so this is shown for two uh, observational stations and you can see how well the model picks up the, the observed record, um, sometimes underestimating, overestimating a little bit in some of the, the peak flood years as well. And the performance of the model is highly dependent on whether there are um, a large number of dams upstream of the observational point because that really affects the stream flow, and if we're not modeling those dams, which we're not in this particular uh, version of the model, then the performance of the model is uh, slightly degraded. So now we have these simulations historically, and, and now we've got initial simulations for the future. We've been analyzing uh, the variability and extremes in those stream flow simulations. So here's an example for the Volta Basin where we've been looking at drought conditions and specifically here, looking at the durations of droughts, so in stream flow, so basically the number of days that the stream flow is below some drought thresholds, so that is our duration of droughts. And we've been doing that for different 
uh, severities of drought, so moderate, severe, and extreme. And we've been looking at how that's been changing over time. So in the graph, you can see the different severities of drought, moderate, severe, extreme, and you can see how uh, the duration of drought has changed over time. And you can, in particular, you can see that for moderate droughts, you can see that there is a higher frequency in the 1990s and so the more pinky reddy colors compared with the other two decades. So they are shorter duration and more bluey uh, green colors. We've done similar work in Myanmar as well. So again, looking at the drought duration days. Here, um, particularly for moderate drought, we can see other changes going on. And we can see that uh, there is a decreasing trend but severe and extreme days are actually increasing. So we can see more of the kind of pinky blue colors, more of the pinky red colors in the severe and extreme cases as we go in through from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s. We've also been looking at changes in floods and the reasons for those changes as well. So this work here has been looking for the whole of, sub whole of Africa, looking at trends in flood frequency. And we see these distinct patterns of increasing frequency and decreasing frequency depending where you are and in particular you can see so for some of the the larger basins across Africa the Congo the Niger River the Nile you can see increasing uh, frequency of floods and we've been trying to attribute this by looking at changes in antecedent precipitation and soil moisture to understand what is driving these changes obviously this will be a change in precipitation it could also be changes in land cover but it tends to be climate variability that really drives changes in large-scale um, flooding. Um, as I said, we've been looking at two timescales for the future. I'll just show some quick examples here for the seasonal forecasting. So we've been looking to try to develop a forecasting system of stream flow out to six months. So that may have some usefulness in improving, for example, dam, dam operations. So if we know something about the stream flow that's entering the reservoir over the next one to six months, we can actually make some decisions about how we operate the dam to improve how that is done. So we've been looking at different um, seasonal climate models um, from a European data set, database, and we've been evaluating those initially for precipitation and temperature for the wet and dry seasons and looking at daily extremes and droughts as well. And the figure down below shows some examples for the Nile and the Volta showing the skill in terms of the correlation coefficient of those forecasts against um, observed data for lead times from one to six months. So that's the x-axis. That lead time is basically how far in advance we are forecasting. And it's shown for different uh, European climate models. So ECMWF is in the red. We also have some other uh, models there. And what you can see is the skill of the models is reasonable in the first month. So we can forecast out to one month reasonably well, precipitation and temperature. But as we go out to two, three or four months, as you might expect, that skill declines. Now, we're working on developing the stream flow forecasting aspect of that. Again, taking those precipitation and temperature forecast, pushing them through a hydrological model and making forecasts of stream flow. And we expect that the skill of the stream flow forecast to actually be better than the precipitation because there is some inertia in the system um, that helps us give, gets us bigger improve skill out to further um, forward in time. So we're working on that right now. So other plans, so simulate and deliver the final climate change based stream flow to University of Manchester. That's going to be about an ensemble of about 50 members of um, future climate stream flow uh, across different climate model forcings, across different emission scenarios. We're going to assess the hydrological impact of climate change on the three case studies based on that data and we're currently finalizing and about to submit some papers related to the seasonal forecasting and the hydrological droughts and floods that I showed some examples here. And we're working with the climate, energy and agricultural teams to produce some hopefully high impact climate change related papers. So thanks very much for listening.